Right. Go to plan B. On? All good? Fantastic. Uh, it's been a strange couple of weeks. We've gone from uh, COVID, uh, pre-Easter. Uh, I've had surgery. Uh, then uh, we've gone to a virus, to COVID again. And uh, I've had a bit of a cold, so that's probably why you saw me wearing a mask. I've done, uh, like all of us, we've had so many probes up our nose. Um, <laughs> I'd start to believe that aliens are real. Uh, but yeah, we've tested and the PCR is negative, And so it's great to be with you this morning after missing last Sunday. It was wonderful last Sunday to watch so many testimonies of people who have taken the initiative this uh, last while and crossed the street, uh, served someone, uh, shared with someone, uh, and how God is using these moments. Uh, I've shared a few times uh, about some different people I've been working with and, and new opportunities, and I look forward to sharing stories as we go. But really want to encourage you, it doesn't stop now with the end of May. That is the beginning. Uh, that is the the, the uh, stirring in our spirits. Uh, God wants to keep taking us across the street and using us to, to love and, and serve and share Jesus with those around us. So really encourage to keep us, uh, keep continuing uh, to walk across the street. I wonder if you'd pray with me now. Heavenly Father, we do thank you. We thank you for the joy and the privilege it is not only to know you and, and to follow you, but to follow you into your mission. God, and we thank you for the many people who took a step of faith and a courageous step throughout the month of May. And we pray that you would continue to lead us more and more as your people. That you would guide us by your spirit. You would give us the courage when we need to speak boldly and clearly about our love for Jesus. God, we pray that you would be with us this morning as we begin our new series, uh, a series in the book of Exodus, that you would use it uh, to speak to us and encourage us in this season. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, September 2014, which is our annual holiday season uh, for us, Jess and I polled our three girls into the, the extra we had at the time and headed off on a family road trip. There was the longest road trip we had ever done uh, for a holiday in the rumour that we will never forget. Early in the morning, we crammed in the, the, the kids and the, the last of our luggage and set off on the road, and, and things were pretty uneventful. Things went pretty well until 10 minutes out of our, away from our hotel in Marimbula, where Evie vomited. Evie vomited everywhere, all over herself, all over her car seat, everywhere. And so we jumped out, we stopped on the side of the road, we did what we could uh, to clean her up before we went and checked in at our hotel and quickly asked for cleaning products to, to, to deal with the car. And so we spent the first night of our holidays cleaning out the car, trying to get rid of the smell so we could continue driving the next day. Uh, this pretty much set the tone for our holidays, which some of you have heard about before. In particular, as we uh, embarked on this whale-watching adventure. Uh, like all of us, we were super excited. Uh, we were super excited about getting out and seeing the whales as they migrated south. And so we all piled onto this small boat for what followed was uh, the longest three hours of my life. Shortly after leaving the, the safety of inlet, the calm waters, uh, the, the water began, the waves began to rise. The boat was getting tossed around. Within 20 minutes of our three-hour trip, I was hanging out the side of the boat feeling unwell and feeding some of the fish. A little while later, Evie, who we have now know after her episode outside of Verimbula, gets motion sickness like her dad, vomited all over the floor of the boat. Shortly after, Kayla, who had eaten copious amounts of cheese and crackers for morning tea, uh, vomited. And then Zoe, who was about eight months old at the time, slept through all the commotion and was having a wonderful time only to wake up and vomit all down the front of Jess. Then after multiple trips in and out of the cabin, trying to take to juggle three children with her useless husband still hanging over the side of the boat, Jess joined the party. After three hours of vomiting, I have to admit, I was wishing I was dead. We had zero worthwhile photos. We had turned this other young couple on the boat off having children <laughs> for the rest of their lives. And when we saw the whales, Evie summed it up. When we saw the whales, she said, I hate whales. <laughs> and I think we might have all been feeling a little similar. As we come to this morning, ready to begin this epic series in Exodus, 
I wonder if you've ever found yourself in that place, in that situation. If you've ever done maybe a family road trip where everything came up down there. It had that long anticipated adventure or holiday where everything went horribly, horribly wrong. See, the book of Exodus, if you like, is a family road trip. It is a family road trip that echoes all the way back to Abraham in the book of Genesis. And a promise made that he would become and he would establish a great nation, a great people, a great family. And he would lead them into this land of promise, a land flowing with milk and honey, where God, a land where God would dwell among his people. And yet on this road trip, as many of us would know, things don't go according to plan. This road trip has many unexpected twists and hits. It is a journey that will test the people of God at every turn, in every way, before they arrive at their destination. Interestingly, interesting, as much as the story of Exodus, the journey of God's people is ancient history. The more I've read it over the past few months, the more it seems to speak into our current situation, our current experiences in some of the profound and powerful ways. As we continue to journey through plagues or the pandemic, as we like, emerge out of lockdown or slavery and into a season, a new season as the people of God. As we prepare for this journey, as we prepare to leave our safe and often comfortable middle class Christianity, as we prepare to step more fully into the promises of God, it's helpful to see and to learn from the journey of God's people in Exodus. It's helpful to be reminded again of God's faithfulness, as Michael has shared with us, to God's faithfulness to his people. And to let that guide our response as we undertake this long and difficult, God-inspired journey. This journey to freedom. If you've got your Bible handy, you can join me in the book of Exodus, where Amanda read for us, where Moses, the uh, author and the lead character in this story, takes a moment to set the scene. And the first thing I want us to notice is that Joseph is dead. Joseph is dead and it's uh, the end of an era for the people of God. See, in the beginning, in verse 1, uh, we, we read, it says, These are the names of the sons of Israel who went to Egypt with Jacob, each with his family, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, uh, Gad, and Asher. The descendants of Jacob numbered 70 in all, and Joseph was already in Egypt. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was to write a, a story or a screenplay or a movie, we wouldn't usually start with a list of names, would we? We wouldn't usually start with the, the, the sons of Israel. And so it's interesting to note, if you're reading in the Hebrew here, rather than the or these, the first word Moses uses is and. And what this and tells us is that Exodus is part of a larger story. It's, part of, it's a continuation of Genesis. It is the second chapter in this ongoing story of God. It is season two in this five-part series made up by the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. And the focus, the focus of this, this story is on Jacob, who would later have his name changed to Israel and his family. This is the beginning of his family, his tribe, the beginning of the nation of Israel who are in Egypt under the leadership of this young man, Joseph. Joseph, if you remember, was the, the favourite son, wasn't he? He was the favourite son of Jacob, the envy of all his brothers who in this fit of jealousy threw him into the bottom of a well and left him to die. That is until they saw an opportunity to make a quick buck from him and sold him to some traders who took him to Egypt. And so Joseph is sold off as a slave, isn't he? His brothers go back to his father and report him dead. And yet by the sovereign hand of God, he is taken out of this pit and becomes the prime minister of Egypt. And under his rule, Egypt became the superpower of the world. Egypt was known and, and feared for their military might, for their incredible infrastructure, and for the many monuments like the Pyramid of Gaza that dominated the horizons and caused the nations to fear and tremble at their name. Pyramids like this were huge. They stood some 50 stories. Some of you have probably been to them. 50 stories high. 
And unlike our modern high-rises, they were built entirely by human hand. I was watching a, a documentary actually on Friday night that explored some of that process. And so the nation of Israel, uh, and they are built by the hands, not of the Egyptians, are they? But of the hands of God's people. And so the nation of Egypt is flourishing. The people of God, it says, are multiplying. And verse 6, in verse 6, we see Joseph. It says, Joseph and his brothers and all that generation died. But the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly, increased in numbers, and became so numerous, the land was filled with them. And so over the years, Joseph, he has served Egypt well. And Egypt has supplied for Joseph and his family in abundance. And yet this is still a long way from their final destination, isn't it? This is still a long way from the promised land. And so now with Joseph dead, the end of an era, Israel is stuck in this foreign land dwelling in this pagan, pluralistic culture, completely at odds with the worship of their God, the one true God, the the God of Abraham, of Isaac and, and of Jacob. And yet they continued to flourish. And that's what makes Joseph reign in Egypt so remarkable. He was able to negotiate his way between the politics of his day and the patterns of worship required by the people of God. And this same challenge really confronts us today, doesn't it? As the church today, I was reading earlier this week, as as much as we would hate to admit it, Christendom is dead. Christendom is dead. Take a look around you. Christianity is no longer the dominant cultural narrative. The church is no longer at the centre. The people of God no longer hold power. We are just one religious sect in the midst of many in an increasingly pagan and and pluralistic society. And as a people of God, we need to figure how to live in this space, to live as foreigners, to live as the people of God in a fallen and broken world. Absolutely, we can live in the past and we can try and reclaim the power that we've used and abused one generation after the next. We can try and reclaim what was Or we can continue to step forward in faith. We can continue to grow and and to flourish by seeking new and creative ways to worship and serve God. And to engage with the world around us. Just like Joseph. So Joseph is dead. Joseph is dead. He is no longer mediating on behalf of his people. And with this change in parliament, so emerges this menacing threat for the people of Israel, this inherent danger in the form of a new pharaoh. And scene two, we pick up, as we pick up scene two, we see the sting, the sting of slavery. It says, then a new king, whom Joseph to, meant, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them or they will become even more numerous. And and if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies, fight against us and leave the country. It's amazing, isn't it? It's amazing how quickly we forget our history. Uh, I've been watching some things over the news and some interactions on Facebook that that have been talking about in Australia, this attempt to rewrite our history, to rewrite the history of our nation without the the Christian influence having a central place. How quickly we forget and undervalue our history. And the same with this new pharaoh. After 400 years, he had forgotten about Joseph, forgotten his legacy, forgotten his leadership, forgotten the way his ancestors had flourished. And under the guise of national security, he revokes the laws, allowing the people of God to live and to thrive and to worship freely and instills this fear. He instills fear, intimidation and persecution. It's interesting to note here that the the two things that concern Pharaoh most relate to the things, the very things that God had promised Abraham all those years ago. God had promised him growth 
hadn't he? That they would multiply and they would fill the earth, that his new, uh, descendants would become as numerous as the stars in the sky and a land where they could flourish, a land where they could establish themselves as a nation and freely worship and serve their God again. And so Pharaoh is not only pushing against the people of God, Pharaoh is opposing the very thing that God has determined by his grace to do. And like any dictator, he knows that by tapping into people's fears, he can justify any actions that he chooses. So verse 11, it says, They put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labour. They built Pithom and Ramesses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they were oppressed, the more they spread and multiplied. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with harsh labour in brick and mortar, with all kinds of work in their fields, in their harsh labour. The Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. It's a pretty stark picture, isn't it? And we know throughout the movies and the history, we often see these uh, Egyptians, don't we, as taskmasters carrying whips and clubs to beat the people of God, to gain their submission, to continue the work of Pharaoh, uh, these cities of sanctuary and of storage in case of emergency. And so Pharaoh persecuted the people of God at every turn. And it's interesting, as we so often see in, uh, in pa- places where the church is persecuted, it says the more they were beaten, the more they were oppressed, the more they were persecuted, the more they multiplied. The people of God continued to flourish. And so Pharaoh, as his last resort, introduces the final stage of his plan. Genocide. In this sickening move, move the, the, the king, the Pharaoh, gathered uh, the Hebrew midwives. And verse 15 says, The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shipra and Pua, When you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see the baby is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, let her live. And we've seen the reverse of this play out in some countries, haven't we? Where daughters are undervalued, where people are bought and uh, discard their daughters in favours of sons to create a stronger, more prosperous nation. And, And so here, by killing off the sons of Israel, Pharaoh's plan is to reduce. To reduce their numbers, to kill off any potential leaders or warriors and to bring the nation of Israel to their knees. And so this is an incredibly dark and and difficult moment for the people of Israel, the people of God. This looks completely hopeless. The people of God feel completely helpless. But as you and I know, there is more going on than meets the eye. Because this battle and our battle is not against flesh and blood. Uh, When we were growing up, as kids, we had a couple of traditions that would shape our, our Sundays. Uh, the, the first was church, 9.15 Sunday morning. So yes, 10 o'clock is a sleep in. Uh, I'm sure you can make it on time. Um, but then followed by uh, chicken, roast chicken, Sunday lunch. And as much as all that sounds pretty hard to beat, the highlight, the highlight came in the afternoon as we prepared ourselves for the WWF Smackdown. Does anyone know that? Any, oh, there's only a couple of people who recognise, sounds like a, so only a few wrestling fans, but for those who, who missed the 80s, bad luck, this was the rise of professional wrestling and the, the global expansion of the World Federation of Wrestling. Every Sunday afternoon, Dad and the boys would make it into our lounge room, would turn on the TV, and right before the main event, there was this moment. And those who watch will remember this moment uh, that sparked hysteria in every lounge room across the whole nation as the announcer cried these famous words, Let's get ready to rumble! And this epic battle between good and evil would begin. Not only on the screen, but in our home. See, admittedly, these words, these words not only created hysteria across our nation, but they did in our home. And so there were numerous injuries as the boys, uh, and more, even more tears as we tried to mimic the moves of these wrestlers in our own home, using household items to resolve unresolved issues. As you can imagine, we were devastated to find out this was all a farce. 
But this call to battle that's stirred up in the hearts of God's people represents something of this real and eternal struggle between good and evil that has plagued humanity for generation after generation. See, there's more than the story of one nation's uh, struggle for survival. Exodus is the unfolding struggle between good and evil, between the two kingdoms of work in our world. The two kingdoms that are still at work today. Don't get me wrong, there will always be human names, won't there? Faces like this Pharaoh. But the greatest trick the devil ever pulled is to convince the world that he doesn't exist. Behind, that behind this human facade, there is nothing else at work. And yet we know, we know that the devil is real. He is prowling, he is seeking to deceive and destroy. He stands in opposition to everything God has determined to do. He was there at the beginning with the fall. He was here in Egypt with the oppression and the slavery. He was here in the, there in the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus falls on his knees to pray and he's at work in our world today. Looking to distract, to overwhelm and to enslave the people of God. We might not be slaves like Egypt, beaten and whipped and abused. But how often do we become enslaved by the patterns and the problems of this world? For some people, it might be the bright lights of the pokey. For some, the allure of alcohol. I worked with a guy a couple of years ago, a great guy with so much potential, a young family at home, and yet he was sleeping on the streets and drinking himself to death. Uh, for, for some, it might be the endless desire in our society for money and success. Keep up the right image and earn the approval of others. For some of us, it could even be our religious traditions. These patterns that, that cause us to try and keep up appearances and, and to earn God's love and grace and affection. Whatever it is that holds us captive this morning, the good news is that freedom is coming. Freedom has come. Freedom has come for Israel and it has come for you and for me. Because even though the devil seems to have everything in control in this opening chapter of Exodus, God appears to be silent and even missing in the picture. What we discover in the book of Exodus is that God is supreme, that God is sovereign over all, that he never surrenders to evil, he, he never abandons his people, he never gives up on his promises. And this leads to our third and our final scene, this glimmer of hope. This glimmer of hope for the people of God. On one side, you have this incredibly great and powerful Pharaoh who always gets what he wants. And if anyone stands in his way, they get what's coming to them. And he's willing to murder uh, anyone, including children, even the sons of God. And then we have these two Hebrew midwives, Shipra and Pua, who have nothing, who have no power, no recognition. They have nothing except the courage to defy the king. The courage to stand up and defy the Pharaoh. Remember what Pharaoh said? When you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see it's a boy, kill him. If it's a girl, let her live. And verse 17 continues, The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. Then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? Can you imagine that moment as these women? These women feared God and had defied the orders of Pharaoh. They feared God and had stood firm in the face of injustice. They feared God and were willing to follow him no matter what the costs. And as a result, they get dragged in front of this fickle Pharaoh with uh, godlike fantasies to justify their actions. And don't you love their explanation? Their response in this moment of crisis. Their response inspired by the Spirit, as we've heard over these past couple of weeks. What do they say? They say, you're Egyptian women, they are soft. They take forever to push their babies out, but the Hebrew women are done and dusted before the midwives can make it along to the scene. It's almost what happened with my older brother. He was almost born in the car on the way to the hospital. My dad would have been no use as a midwife. 
But it was all self-induced because my dad wanted his morning tea before taking mum to the hospital. And yet these two ordinary women are caught, aren't they? Caught between a rock and a hard place. And yet in the moment, in this crisis, they choose to take a stand for God. Did you notice how God responds? In keeping with his uh, promise, we read in verse 20, God was kind. God was kind to the midwives and to the people. And the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives had feared God, he gave them families of their own. Well, Pharaoh remains just Pharaoh. Throughout the whole of the book of Exodus, these women... These women are named, they are known and they are blessed by God. They are blessed in keeping with his promise. They receive families of their own. The people of God continue to increase and out of all the sons and daughters who were spared, indeed saved because of their selfless actions, God brings a deliverer, his redeemer, to free his people from slavery. I don't know about you, but I find that such an encouragement. Such an inspiration that that even in our darkest moments, even when everything feels like it's coming undone, our faith is being challenged and the forces of evil are pressing against us, God's promises are secure. And his saving purposes will continue to work their way out in and through our lives. They advance through these midwives, advance through the arrival of Moses, as we'll see in the following chapter, advance through the book of Exodus, advance with the introduction of Mary and Joseph. And we know, as we know, they have now found their fulfillment in Jesus, who through the power of his life, death and resurrection has delivered humanity from sin, has restored us to relationship with God, is gathering us into his promised kingdom. But until that day, until that day comes, until Jesus returns, he calls us, doesn't he, to continue his mission, to continue to make a difference in this world. And so when it comes to making it, so often when it comes to making a difference, we think about position, we think about status, we think about power. And yet God, by his grace, takes these two ordinary women and he meets them. He meets them in their fears, gives them courage in their convictions and through their obedience... He brings his promises, his saving purposes to bear in a beautiful and powerful way among the people of God. You know, the same is true today. That God is looking for ordinary people. Ordinary people like you and me who are known and loved by God. Who know and love God. And who are willing to trust him, not only in the big moments, but obey him with our everyday decisions. And take a stand against the patterns of evil and justice so we can pave the way for Jesus' kingdom. For Jesus' kingdom of love and life to be uh, infiltrate and influence the shape of our world. So ultimately Jesus, isn't it? Jesus is the one who can save us. He's the one who can save us from the brokenness of the world. He is the one who can free us from the a slave life of slavery and sin. He is the one, the one who calls us to live with a purpose. Jesus is the one who invites us not only to know him and love him and worship him, but to serve him, trusting that our ordinary efforts in his strength, through his power, will achieve something extraordinary to reveal the beauty and the blessing of Jesus. We are ordinary people whose lives are in the hands of an extraordinary God. And he wants to use us. He wants to use you. He wants to bless the work of your hands. He wants to extend the realms of his kingdom. Through you, he wants to bring heaven to earth in a way that would touch hearts and would change lives and and would alter the shape of our community forever.
And as we begin this series, as we begin this series in Exodus, my sense is now is the perfect time. Now is the perfect time for a road trip. A good old-fashioned family road trip. Now is the perfect time for, for the people of God to come together, to set our hearts on Jesus and to move forward in faith. And when it comes to road trips, I know. I know some of us have a tendency to whinge and complain, right? A little like the kids in the back seat or the Israelites throughout Exodus. I know they haven't started yet. It's only a matter of time. In fact, they spend the next 40 years, don't they? Constantly whinging and groaning and complaining. Moses, it's too hot. Can we have a drink? Do we really have to walk again? Are we there? Can we have another God yet? And like the Israelites, we can take our next steps under sufferance, whinging and complaining. Or we can choose to live with faith and obedience like these midwives. To relearn what it means to trust God, to fear God, to revere God and, and to live for him alone. Knowing that he is faithful. He is faithful to his people, faithful to his promises, faithful to seeing everything find its yes and amen in Jesus. And so God wants to call us out of our safe, middle class existence. He wants to lead us out of our safe, predictable patterns of church. And it will require us to admit that Christendom is dead. Christendom is done. For us to be ready and willing to live by the Spirit. To live a life of faith and obedience. To follow Jesus no matter what the costs. Only then will we see the darkness of this world push back. As we shine the light of Christ into our homes, into our streets, into our communities, into our workplaces, into the injustices we see that weigh so heavily on our hearts. God has a habit. God has a habit of using ordinary people like you and me to do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine. He wants to lift us up. He wants to call us out. He wants to move us forward to help us flourish so we can explore new and creative ways to worship and serve God as we engage with this broken, this fallen and broken world around us. And the question for each of us is, would we have the courage Would we have the courage and conviction of these two midwives? Would we have the courage and conviction to stand up against the injustice of our world and to reflect the life and the love of Jesus? To offer the hope Jesus gives in a way that makes sense. I trust this morning, I trust as we continue through this series of Exodus, that you would join me, that together we would step out in faith, one step of obedience at a time, and God would lead us into a new season, into the the fullness of his promises, to find the yes and amen in Jesus. Pray with me as we close. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for the book of Exodus, the story of your people. God, we thank you for the challenges that your people have faced that give us a sense of hope and encouragement in the challenges we face today. God, we thank you for these midwives. Humble, ordinary, working women. Show us what it means to make a difference for you in our community. God, like these women, we pray that you would allow us and you would uh, remind us of who you are. You would teach us again what it means to know you, to fear you, to worship you. That you would lead us afresh.
to engage with our world and uh, in a lifestyle of worship where we seek to show and, and reflect Jesus in everything we say and we do. And we pray that you would use us to stand up against injustice and usher in the kingdom of God. And in those moments where we feel alone, when we feel afraid, when we feel uncertain about the path to take, when we are unsure about the, the next step, we ask that you would give us, you would remind us that you are faithful. That you will be faithful to lead us. You will strengthen us in our weakness. You will give us the words to speak when we need. And you will use us to bless our world and to allow your kingdom work to continue to flourish. Not only today and tomorrow, but in the weeks and, and the years to come. Until that great and glorious day when Jesus returns. And everything is made new. God, lead us, guide us, strengthen us, use us. Fill us with your spirit, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.